get a big round of applause for Miss Allegra Scales, please. Thank you, thank you. Okay, hi everybody. So today I'm going to be talking about George Orwell, specifically one of his most famous essays called Politics in the English Language. I'm sure that some of you have read it because other than his more famous works of the dystopian totalitarianism novel 1984 and his allegory on Stalinism, Animal Farm, this is perhaps his most enduring work in terms of affecting culture in terms of affecting the way that we've thought in the 21st century. So it was written in 1946, which does create a little bit of distance from our time now. But I think s most of the principles remain absolutely solid in terms of what we're going to talk about later. The first difference though, possibly, the most important one is that he is specifically in his essay talking about written prose and in the 40s, which was arguably a more simple time, everybody did genuinely write letters, people contributed essays when they had a thought piece. It was a slightly elitist world of intellectualism, but it was all done through long writing. His advice towards clear language in writing is directed towards those things. I'll get to it more later on, but obviously now our exchange of communication is very, very different. So the central point that we need to get on board with to begin unpacking this Orwell essay is that he thought that the language that we use, every human being and our ability to use language, is connected intrinsically to our ability to think and vice versa. They have a cause and effect relationship with each other. When you're trying to summarize Orwell, often there seems to be no point and just say exactly what he said because his speech is so very clear. So on the first page of his essay, he writes, a man may take to drink because he feels himself to be a failure and then fail all the more completely because he drinks. It is rather the same thing that is happening to the English language. It becomes ugly and inaccurate because our thoughts are foolish, but the slovenliness of our language makes it easier for us to have foolish thoughts. <laughs> the ultimate idea that he is approaching is about the idea of grasping reality through clarity, through the words that you understand, that you can grasp. And so you have a sense of the world around you that can't overwhelm you with vagueness. So for Orwell, being able to speak with clarity is a revolutionary act. So this is, I'm just going to get them all up. Bear with me one sec. I'll get them up to here. Okay, so in his essay, he chooses five extracts from five examples of contemporary writing, contemporary again in the 1940s, including academic and magazine essays, a letter in a newspaper, and a communist pamphlet. Two things, he says, are common to all of them, staleness of imagery and lack of precision. These are the things that make them bad writing. When he talks about staleness of imagery, he is explaining that it is only a vivid image in the sense of similes, metaphors, that can express to a listener or to a reader something that makes sense. When something is a hackneyed phrase that's used too often, it loses its grip. So it just slips through our ears and we don't listen to it. And it was pointless to say it in the first place. The second is about lack of precision. So often we complicate what we're trying to say for plenty of reasons that he outlines in a moment. But really, lack of precision is such an enemy to accurate thought, which by extension is an enemy of grasping the reality of what's happening around you, that this isn't just a small semantic or literary problem. It affects the way that we can relate with what's happening around us. So the specific writing habits that he mentions, he writes quite a list, but I've just selected three that I think are important. 
he talks about the use of what he calls a dying metaphor, but I think it's more relevant for our purposes to refer to this as a cliche. He specifically outlines the use of the word, outlaws, sorry, the use of the word cliche because it's a French word. And <laughs> he says that you should always use the English word in the English language where the English word will do to avoid pretension, which is a bit archaic. And even Orwell isn't beyond being a bit archaic. So I think we, we can use the word cliche. It makes more sense, really. So the reason that a cliche limits our ability to grasp the clarity of what's happening around us is that we've heard them so many times that they don't leave an impression. Common cliches that we would use would be things like, uh, tomorrow is another day, every cloud has a sil silver lining, uh, what's done is done, uh, everything happens for a reason. And often in these moments when we are giving advice like that or we're uttering cliches like that, is because we're trying to reassure people. So we're actually having a moment where we're trying to reach out in an emotional way for emotional clarity. But we reach, and the phrase that Orwell uses, it, one of my favorite phrases he has is, always the packet of aspirin at one's elbow. It's the lazy moment that we reach to when we're not necessarily thinking about what we're saying. And therefore, it's not so useful. The second one, uh, pretentiousness. When we use excessive words to dress things up, we're distracting from what they actually mean. Now, I'm sure all of us, I definitely have, tried to hit a word count in an essay <laughs> by just using excessively long words. We know we're doing it, and we know we're talking shit. And that's basically, <laughs> that's all there is to it with pretension. It's, it's that simple. And the third one is meaningless words. Now, this is an instance in Orwell's essay where I believe, ironically, he actually misrepresents himself when he says meaningless words. What he means better, I think, is words which don't have a concrete meaning, a meaning that we can all agree on. The words he uses in his meaningless words list are things like democracy, freedom. These aren't meaningless words, but they're not useful because we cannot ground them to a concrete agreement of what we definitely all mean. And therefore, they can be easily abused. So Orwell warns against using words like this to create a structure for an entire sentence. Because <laughs> if you can make the meaning of that word shift, everything else falls away. He calls it meaningless, which is a bit far. He's got criticism for that. So I think it's better to describe them as meaning uh, without concrete meaning. So once he's explained all of this and how important this ability is to grasp language, he explains that ready-made phrases, when they can construct your sentences for you, concealing your meaning even from yourself. You don't have to choose your own words, you can just borrow them and slip them straight into a paragraph. It is at this point that the special connection between politics and the debasement of language becomes clear. This is part two of his essay. Okay, so this, and again, I've just used quotes from his essay for this, there's no need to rephrase him, he's just... He said it perfectly already. This is his most famous quote from Politics in the English Language. Politi political language is designed to make lies sound truthful and murder respectable and to give an appearance of solidarity to pure wind. And then he says, in our time, political speech and writing are largely the defense of the indefensible. Thus, political language has to consist largely of euphemism, question begging, and sheer cloudy vagueness. One example that strikes me the most of recent years of euphemism is the idea of the war on terror. Terror is an abstract noun. We use this vagueness to umbrella term an entire war, which means exactly that any action within the war can be manipulated to have some root and just cause somewhere under the umbrella of the uh, ideology of the people orchestrating it. Now, this is not to say that there are, there are parts of the war on terror which are not justified. I'm not even casting dispersions on the events that lie within. But there is clearly a power dynamic that is controlled through euphemism and the phrase the war on terror, you can bend your meaning to mean anything. So that would be a modern example of what Orwell said all this time ago, which is so typical of Orwell. He always can predict the future in a strange sense. 
The second phrase that I borrowed just to explain him was, when one watches some tired hack on the platform mechanically repeating the familiar phrases, and he uses all these cliches and dead metaphors here, which are more, well obviously we would have heard them more in the 40s and less now, but bestial, atrocities, iron heel, bloodstained tyranny, free peoples of the world, stand shoulder to shoulder. One often has a curious feeling that one is not watching a live human being, but some kind of dummy. Now, when I was first, the first time I wrote about this essay was in 2015. I was just graduating from university, and in the UK, we were holding a general election. The BBC began to host uh, live television debates, and it was a great idea. And the four leaders of the four parties that were vying for the election at the time, they were standing on stage, and they were being given questions by a large audience. I watched that with this phrase in mind, maddened by what I was watching. At no point did any of those four politicians tether any actual meaning into anything accurate that they said. It was platitude after platitude after vague platitude about changing things, about making a difference. At no point did any word hit just a clarified sentence. And then because it was a live television debate, the host gave members of the, uh, the, of the audience the opportunity to say, no, answer my question, answer my question. And it was live TV. And amazingly, they just said the same thing again. And I remember I couldn't believe it. And yet, that was 2015. And I miss that time. <laughs> I really do. Because now, what we have to deal with oh is this. And this sets, to borrow a word that is very much one of these, we don't know what to say about Trump, so all we can say is this, unprecedented events in political language is this. So, as far as I'm concerned, his most notable achievement is the recipient of the Double Speak Award 2016. The Double Speak Awards have been being held by the National Council of Teachers of English, that's in the United States, actual English teachers in schools, uh, since 1974. In 2016, Donald Trump won the unanimous vote of the panel, and one member was quoted as saying, I don't think we've ever had a better example of double speak. For the, I'm sure lots of you already know this, but doublespeak is a phrase, is a word that represents a concept which originated in Orwell's first essay in Politics of the English Language and found its literary expression in 1984. It is the ability to say one thing and intentionally mean exactly another, to distort the exact meaning of the word by deliberately almost saying the opposite thing. Those who have read uh, 1984 will recognize these last three phrases here. War is peace, freedom is slavery, and ignorance is strength. And this cartoon I found adds two at the beginning, which belong to Trump. Money is speech, and corporations are people. There's plenty of examples of Trumpian doublespeak, however, which I will just put up here. His tweeting habits are something which I would love to know what Orwell could have said about that. He couldn't quite have predicted on what kind of platform Trump can reach so many millions of people at one time. The pervasive, distorted power of his tweeting is that he can allow himself to appear more down-to-earth more human, more unscripted than the political establishment that came before him, that we can all agree is guilty of everything that Orwell has already outlined. And then Trump just smashes the ball out of the park by just becoming 1984 and almost Trump, if you allow me that pun, trumping <laughs> what was in the previous essay. Fake news, of course, is a concept that has just become irremovable from the concept of Trumpism itself. And this is, double speaker is purist. He can stand and openly lie, give falsehoods, false facts that can be proven by statistical data and just people's eyes 
can prove that something Donald Trump has recently said is not factual. And simultaneously, he attacked any attempt at open media and open discourse as being lies. That is what doublespeak is. Uh, the Washington Post is very interesting if you go on their website. Is it? Okay. Uh, have been recording the president's false or misleading claims. And as of the 30th of their October, just a few days ago, there are already 6,420. <laughs> but I'm having to wrap up now because I've run over a bit. But thank you all for listening. And this is all fucked. I don't know. <laughs>